Good day. In 1740, French mathematician Norday wrote to Euler, the famous Leonard Euler, um, about a problem he was just playing around with. For some reason, Norday was just playing with, around with number theory, and he asked the following question. Take a number like 5. How many ways can I break down 5 as a sum of distinct positive counting numbers? For example, I could just write 5 all by itself. I could write it as 4 plus 1. I could write it as 3 plus 2. I could also write it as 3 plus 1 plus 1, but what distinct means is no repetition, so no repeating a number. And I believe there's actually just three ways to write down 5 as a distinct, sum of distinct numbers. So we'll say the distinct ways to write down number 5 is 3. And if you play with it a little bit, you can find there's actually uh, the number of distinct ways to write down 4. It could be just 4 itself, 3 plus 1, and that's it. Two ways to write that. And off we go. And then we can actually make a little table of values and just play with these distinct partitions. If this is n, this is d of n, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I believe there's one way to do this. I believe there's one way to do that one. 2, 2, 3. It looks very Fibonacci-esque, but I'm afraid it's not. If you do six ways, I believe there's only four ways to break that one down. And if you like a little challenge, it's got to a bigger number like 13. It turns out there's 18 ways to break the number 13 down into distinct parts. You want, might want to check that. Anyhow. He was just playing with this for some reason, just having fun. And he wrote to Leonard Euler about it and asked, asked some questions about these distinct partitions. And Euler discovered something remarkable. Euler not only looked at distinct partitions, but he realized, and in a matter of course of one evening, the tale goes, that these distinct partitions are very much connected with another type of partition, which we'll call ON, the odd partitions. How many ways can we break down the number N as a sum of odds? For example, five. If we're only going to allow ourselves the use of odd numbers now, 5 can be written as 5. It could also be written as 4 plus 1, but that involves an even number. I'm not going to do that. It can be written as 3 plus 1 plus 1. Um, it could also be written as 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So we allow repeat repetitions this time, but all the numbers involved must be odd. And if you think about it, there's only three ways to write down 5 as a sum of odds. And if you'd like to try another number, like 4, I think you can check 4 can only be 3 plus 1, or 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, and that's it. There's two ways to write the number 4. And a real challenge, you might want to pause for a moment and see if you can work out all the ways you can break 13 down as a sum of odds. And lo and behold, you find there's 18 ways to break down the number 13. So it's worth actually playing with that and double checking. So the big question is, is the number of ways to break a number down into distinct parts always equal to, question mark, question mark, the number of ways to break down the number n into odd parts? And the answer turns out to be yes. And this is a wonderful gem of Euler's, and I'd like to prove it right now, that dn will always equal on. And what Euler did is truly inspired as per usual. So what I'm going to do is the following. Well, I'm going to do what Euler did. Euler first examined the following infinite product, 1 plus x, 1 plus x squared, 1 plus x cubed, whoops, 1 plus x to the fourth, 1 plus x to the fifth, and do that forever. And imagine, despite being uh, human beings that can't deal with the infinite, we could actually expand this out. And we can ask, OK, will there be a constant term? And the answer is yes. It'll come from choosing 1, from 1, 1, choosing 1 in each of the parentheses. So 1 times 1, a whole bunch of 1s multiplied together will be 1. And then will you get a term involving just the single power x? And the answer is yes. Choose x in the first parentheses and choose 1s thereafter, so there'll be a single x. Will there be an x squared? Well, yes, it comes from choosing x squared in the second set of parentheses and choosing 1 in every other spot. 1 times x squared times 1 times 1 times 1 would be x squared. And x cubed, will we have an x cubed term? Well, actually, yes. We'll get it from choosing 1, 1, and x cubed, and then 1s thereafter. But we can also get it from choosing x and then x squared. So actually, we get it from just choosing x cubed directly by doing all the, and 1s thereafter. And we can just choose, get it by choosing x to the 1 and x squared. So actually, there's two ways that x cubed could appear. So we actually, we'll get two x cubed and we'll expand this out. What about x to the 4th? Well, we can get it from choosing x to the 4th directly and 1s everywhere else. Or we can get it from choosing x1 and x3, uh, x1 from the first parentheses, x3 from the third set of parentheses, and 1s everywhere else. And that's about it. So there's two ways to get that. In fact, you can see what's going on now. In fact, if I ask for how many ways can I get the term x to the 13th from this, well, I can choose x to the 13th directly from the 13th set of parentheses, once everywhere else. Maybe it comes from doing, uh, say, x squared, x uh, to the 4th, and x to the 5th. Choosing this x squared, choosing this x 4th, and this x to the 5th. Oh, there's an up to 13, makes x to the 7th. It's more like it. And this x to the 7th. In fact, you see, expanding this particular product 
is really encapsulating all the ways to break down each number n into its distinct parts. That is, each coefficient is going to be the uh, number of ways to break the power of x down into distinct parts. This is the sequence that gives, this is the function that gives us dn. Okay, that's step one of what Euler did in that one evening. So if you want to study the sequence of numbers dn, he's just basically said expand this purple function, whoops, which I'll put in a red box, and you will see the sequence dn appear as the coefficient of the power of x. So now, can we do a similar trick for on, the odd partitions? And he said, well, yes, do the following. This time, look at this infinite product, 1 plus x to the 1 plus, I'm going to write x squared as x to the 1 plus 1, and I'm going to write x cubed as 1 plus 1 plus 1, and so on. So there's an infinite sum. Multiply that by 1 plus x squared plus x to the, whoops, x cubed, I meant x to the 3 plus 3, x to the 3 plus 3 plus 3, da da da. Multiply that by x to the 5th, 1 plus x to the 5th, plus x to the 5 plus 5, plus x to the 5 plus 5 plus 5, and so on, and do that forever. There's an infinite product of infinite sums. And let's ask the very same question. What happens if we expand this one out? Well, will there be a constant term? Yes, it comes from choosing one from each set of parentheses forevermore. A whole bunch of ones multiplied together will give me one. Will there be a single x term? Well, yes, just choose the x from the first set of parentheses and one everywhere else. And I think it's the only way to get an x term. How do I get an x squared term? Well, I can choose this x squared from the first set of parentheses, and that's really coming from x1 plus 1, I'll put it that way, and that's going to be it. There's only one way to get an x squared term. Things get interesting with the x cubed term. I get x cubed from choosing the x cubed from the second set of parentheses, so it goes 1 x cubed and 1 thereafter, or you get it from this x cubed in the first set of parentheses, which is written as 1 plus 1 plus 1, and that's about it. Two ways. And in fact, you can see what's going on here. Let's go all the way up to x to the 13th power. How could I get x to the 13th? One way we choose x to the 13th and the 13th, the, the set of parentheses corresponds to powers of x to the 13th. Or maybe I get it from choosing, say, um, this 5 plus 5 term and this 3 term, x to the 3, x to the 5 plus 5. Or maybe I get it from choosing, say, 13 ones from the very first set of parentheses, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. In fact, this expansion is really counting all the ways to break 13 down as a, breaking 13 down as a sum of odd numbers. So I bet the coefficient of x to the 13 is going to be 18. Basically, all is saying, here's the function that you want to play with if you want to play with the sequence on. Oof, pretty messy. On. So the claim is that dn and on are the same set of numbers. Well, all I said, all I need to do to prove that is to prove that this top function equals this bottom function. Is that easy? Well, actually, it really is. Uh, let's do that now. Here goes. I need to make myself some space. And Euler assumes that you've taken second semester calculus or pre-calculus calculus or something from, from school that makes you real, has you realize that the geometric series formula is a valid quantity, at least algebraically, that 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on, all the way up is 1 over 1 minus x. Because you look at this function for on, the second one, that's just a whole bunch of geometric series formulas multiplied together. One is in powers of x, so this is 1 over 1 minus x. The second one is times powers of x cubed, 1 minus x cubed, times powers of x to the fifth, x to the fifth, times powers of 1 over x to the seventh, and so on. And here's a stroke of genius. It's missing all the even powers. So let's insert a 1 in between all these spaces in this infinite product. I've conveniently left myself a little bit of space. I want a 1 minus x squared on the bottom, so let's put a 1 minus x squared on the top. A 1 minus x squared, x to the 4th on the bottom, 1 minus x to the 4th on the top. 1 minus x to the 6th on the bottom, 1 minus x to the 6th on the top. So this, this, this function, and I keep doing this forever, um, is exactly the same as the one in purple just above it for the ON. I've just put, inserted some ones. Well, now I'm going to be a little bit sneakier, and 1 minus x squared, that's the difference of two squares. Let's write that as 1 minus x times 1 plus x. This 1 minus x to the 4th, that's 2 is the difference of two squares. 1 minus x squared, 1 plus x squared. That 1 minus x to the 6th is really 1 minus x cubed times 1 plus x cubed. And let's do that forever. But here comes the magic. Look, there's a 1 minus x in the numerator and a 1 minus x in the denominator. They'll cancel. There's a 1 minus x squared in the numerator, 1 in the denominator. 
this 1 minus x cubed in the numerator and the denominator. In fact, there will be a 1 minus x to the fourth in the numerator as well from the next term, which will cancel out 1 minus x to the fourth in the denominator. And the one, this 1 minus x to the fifth on the bottom will cancel one appearing later on at 1 minus x to the fifth on the top. And so on. In fact, all these denominators will disappear. And what are we left behind with? We're left behind with 1 plus x in the numerator times, whoops, 1 plus x squared times 1 plus x cubed forevermore. And lo and behold, that is precisely the function that gives us the numbers dn. So these two functions are in fact identical, therefore these two sequences must be the same. Now, as you can tell from this, Euler wasn't at all shy about playing with infinite formulas and assuming all algebraic techniques still work for them. It's just inspired and brilliant. A modern-day mathematician might want to pause and say, OK, OK, what, what can we really do here in terms of playing with the infinite this way? And I guess that's, that's absolutely valid work to be done. Though, just putting that aside for the moment, let me see if we can push this a little bit further. Here's what Euler said. Whoops. dn equals number ways to break n uh, with no summoned repeated two or more times. Number of distinct ways, so no, no repeating with two or more times. O n equals number of ways, so this is really atrocious writing, break n uh, with no multiples of two involved. So my brain says, if I rewrite it this way, I've used the number 2 explicitly in both expressions. dn is the number of ways with no repeats of 2 or more, and on is the number of ways with no uses of multiples of 2. Here's my challenge for you. Let's replace this with the 3, and let's replace this with the 3. I claim that the number of ways to break n down with no repeats of three or more times, so I'll allow repeats in pairs, but I won't allow a triple of numbers appearing, um, is going to be exactly the same, dn in this case is still equal to on, the number of ways to break out n down without using a single multiple of three. In fact, can you go even further? Take this to any number you like, let's just say k. I claim the number of ways to break n down with no sum and repeated k or more times is always for sure going to equal the number of ways to break n down without using any multiples of k. Well, there we go. That's taking Euler one step further. Have fun. Thanks.